All right, today we are um, looking at uh, Psalm 129. There's only eight verses. But it's about the, uh, the title would be The Enemies of Sion. But before you say, oh, I don't need to hear about that, you need to hear about that. Because Sion is not what you think it is. Okay? And remember, these are imprecatory uh, psalms or prayers. Let's pray first. Father, we do ask for your help and your understanding uh, that we would correctly interpret these psalms, always correctly interpret your word, and that we would apply these things to our own lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there's only eight verses, and, uh, and let's begin. Many times they have afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, many times they have afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed over me. The plowers pl plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. Jehovah is righteous. He cuts into the cords of the wicked. May all those who hate Sion be ashamed and turn back. Let them be like the grass on the roofs, which dries up before it draws out or, or grows up with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his bosom. And do those who pass have not said, The blessing of Jehovah be on you. We bless you in the name of Jehovah. I think that when we understand and of course this is a literal translation so it's a little bit rough uh, and the reason I should add here that I do the literal translations is to help people to see that sometimes not always but sometimes a great deal of liberty is taken when translating what is written in Hebrew into another language such as English and sometimes uh, the English doesn't bear any resemblance at all uh, to the Hebrew. And so uh, to me it's, it's very important to get back to what was originally intended to be read because the Bible is the book of life. And we need to understand it correctly. So my question here is what is Sion. Now I want to notice, have you noticed that I am pronouncing this not with a Z the way it's spelled in English but it is pronounced with a T-S. Sion. Uh, the reason is is because that word that begins with a Z is something that's not good so and that's all I will say. But the question is what is Sion? Well, there are four points that we have to look at to look, answer that question. Now, the ancient Hebrew word, Sion, is a Canaanite hill fortress in Jerusalem that David captured, and it is often called in the Bible, the City of David. And, uh, it, and so it's, it's in the area of Jerusalem. Now that's like, in other words, we're saying it's a city within a city. A city inside a city. Um, now there's another way of looking at this word, uh, Sion, and it's a hill where the most ancient areas of Jerusalem stood before David captured it captured that area called Jerusalem. 
another way of looking at Sion in the Bible is that it is a reference to the city of Jerusalem, the whole city. But there is yet another way that the Bible uses this word Sion. And it says it's the dwelling place of God. So you can see there's a reason why that I'm looking at all this because when you're trying to interpret this psalm, you need to try to understand what the reference is here. Now, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 29, we read this. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival and gladness of heart as when one marches to the flute to go to the mountain of Jehovah to the rock of Israel. Now right there in that one verse, the mountain of Jehovah, many people would assume uh, again that we're talking about this area, the city of David. But when you say the rock of Israel, you're talking about Jehovah. He is the rock of Israel. He is our fortress. Yeah, and I'm talking to Christians here. God is our rock. God is our fortress. And there's lots of rocks over in the Middle East. I used to think that, uh, that here in Pennsylvania and New York we have a lot of rocks. And we do. But Israel's got it beat. Um, but this word Sion is also re referred to in Revelation 21. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but this is one of the references in verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now that's something that we're going to really be looking forward to because you see, that's where we're going to live forever in the New Jerusalem. And that is also Sion. But remember, it's a city within the city. Uh, David yearns for salvation to emerge and you say, well, where's that? Well, Psalm 914 and that verse says that I may tell of all your praises that in the gates of the daughter of Sion I may rejoice in your salvation. Now, it's kind of interesting that David says there the daughter of Sion and you see again when we look at that, we think, well, okay, well, now we're talking about two science. No. When you say daughter of, it's a way of showing tenderness and compassion. I have a daughter, and, um, and I don't react with her or, or speak with her the same way that I do with my sons. Uh, there's something about of uh, the relationship between a father and a daughter that's that's different from a father and his sons. Yes, you love all of them, I do, but there is still something different there. And when David refers to the daughter of Sion, uh, he is combining that with his i his his um his thoughts about God's salvation. And one day, we all, just like David, we are all going to experience that salvation. But in this instance, it created a tenderness in David's mind and heart. And that's why he said that. Now, this reference to Sion is, you can find it a lot in the book of Lamentations and in Jeremiah and Micah. I mean, it's just replete over and over and over. Interesting thought. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. So, preacher, what is the answer to this? Why well, I'm glad that you asked that. Because to get the final answer, 
you have to turn to the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, we read this. This stone in Sion is Jesus, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And then Paul says in Romans 9.33, in Sion, a stone that causes people to stumble. And Jesus does that to this day. People stumble over him. And a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. I was uh, speaking with some men uh, recently in a, a place of business. And we were just the three of us in there. And um, the interesting thing about it was was that people can express their views on politics and things going on and their dismay about uh, the condition of our country and our world. But when you give them the answer that it's the, the rock, Zion, Jesus, everything gets quiet. I don't know if it's that they didn't want to talk about that or if they thought maybe a memory came to their mind of uh, when they were little and went to church or their mother was speaking to them, father was speaking to them about Jesus. But you see, the whole point about this is about Zion. i got to get back on track here. Is Zion is built in your heart just like it was a place of tenderness to to David in Psalm 9 Christ is in a believer's heart if you are a believer and he is the cornerstone of your spiritual life and there isn't any room because remember he's the stone that fills up the whole mountain he fills you up. There's no room for any other being and Jesus wouldn't tolerate any other God or idol there. Nor does the Father. In verses 1 and 2, um, when we were looking at that and it was talking about being afflicted and yet not being prevailed over, this thought... Um, came to uh, McGee, and I, I'm going to read this. The burning bush seen by Moses is the emblem of the miraculous preservation of God's people. Israel was not destroyed because God had preserved them. And I will go and add this. It's true for God's people of all time. He's not going to let you be destroyed. Now in verse 4, he mentions something about plowing. And I don't know if you thought, but I, when I read it immediately, I thought of Jesus' back being scourged. Because it, the, the scourge would leave furrows in the skin ripping the skin out and then he also goes on and he talks about cutting the cords of the wicked um, it's interesting that the cords uh, that one commentator thought it was referring to were the cords that fastened the plow to the ox and the ox plows a furrow well he was saying just a moment ago about the furrows that have been plowed into Israel's back, into God's people's back, and I also think into his son's back. But God cuts the cords so that they can't do any more damage. They want to destroy. And this new world order today wants to destroy, but they're the ones that are going to be destroyed if they don't repent. 
And then he talks about grass on the roofs. And, the, you know, immediately I thought about uh, uh, that old show on TV, Little House on the Prairie, because when they first got had to build their house, that's the way the settlers did it on the prairie. They would use, they would have sod houses, and the roofs would be made of sod. And in the Middle East, they do that. Um, now, God's people are going to flourish, is what David, or, or the psalmist, I don't know if this was David that wrote this, I don't think it was. But the psalmist is saying that God's people are going to flourish, but their enemies will wind up like the grass on a housetop. And these flat roofs that they had, the grass was there to insulate and protect from the rain whenever they might get rain, which wasn't very often, and protect from the heat of the sun, from weather. But... The psalmist is saying what grows there is never going to ripen. And so that is what the designs of God's enemies, they're never going to come to full fruit. Now you say right now you see everything that's going on in our world and you say, boy, it looks like they're getting their way. Well, they're getting their way to a certain point, but they're not going to achieve their goals. You know, J Jesus arose from the dead, and he reigns. And you say, well, I sure don't see him reigning uh, in this world today. He reigns in the hearts of believers. And if he is not having his way in your life, and you don't want him to have his way in your life, then I would say to you, you're not a believer, because a believer wants that. And his people are supported just like that burning bush. It's burned, but it is not consumed. And so therefore there's no reason to be afraid. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I also say to you that you are pebble. That's what Peter's name means is pebble. And on this boulder, and that's what the Greek says, it says, not a pebble, but a boulder. On this boulder, I will build my called out ones, my, what this people say is the church, my assembly. And the gates of hell shall not overpower it. And that's what the Greek word uh, means. God is not going to let us be consumed no matter what these politicians say and these evil new world orders say. He's not going to let that happen because just as much as he, he preserved Israel, he will preserve his gift to his son which is the church. You know, in this spring weather, and I'm looking at an apple tree that's all coming out in bloom, and um, I think about the fact that God is an artist, and we appreciate his beauty. Um, but you know, he takes God's, his word, and he paints pictures with it to help us to see the beauty of salvation how he has preserved Israel through uh, with all her enemies but remember Sion is a city within a city kinda like that book Pilgrim's Progress where the pilgrim is on a, a, a pilgrimage to a city but you see, we carry a city around it within us, and the Holy Spirit lives in us. 
and we become his throne or his throne room and and that's really what all this does by talking about Sion Sion is a place where God reigns in the believer and no matter how much we get scourged he's not going to let us be destroyed let's pray father we thank you for the blessings of your word the blessings of your salvation the blessings of your son for it's in his name we ask these things amen